the world breaks everyone, and afterward, some are strong at the broken places. Ernest Hemingway, A Farewell to Arms. Before they led America through national crises, Presidents Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, and Lyndon Johnson were all transformed by personal trauma. They'd been through the bottom, they'd gotten depressed, they were almost ready to leave public life, and then they came out. And once having been through that, it gives them a strength, I think. It gives them a humility, and it gives them a connection to other people that they didn't have in quite the same way before. Beyond even winning the presidency, these men hungered to make their mark on history. Ambition is a mystery to me, where it comes from in people. It's the most important thing, but it's a spring for success. And then the key is, if you have a dreaming when you're young of some ambition, do you have the discipline and the perseverance to keep going after it? Throughout his life, Lincoln struggled to reconcile a melancholy temperament with a far-reaching ambition. In his early 30s, he fell into a deep depression. Friends worried that he was suicidal. They took all knives and razors and scissors from his room. And his best friend, Joshua Speed, came to his side and said, Lincoln, you must rally or you will die. And he said, I know that. And he said, if everybody had my face, there wouldn't be a cheerful face in the whole world. I would just as soon die now, but I've not yet accomplished anything to make any human being remember that I have lived. So that worthy ambition to leave the world a better place became almost his lodestar. It got him through that depression, and it stayed with him the rest of his life. Lincoln's life armored him with a rare mix of compassion and determination, humility and confidence. As president-elect, he put ego aside to gather the strongest men in the country, convinced he was the strongest of them all. What it showed when Lincoln decided to put his three chief rivals into his cabinet was an enormous internal confidence. Nothing will prevent war. Coming into this office as he was, much less known than the other three, much less celebrated. Each one of them wanted to be president and thought they should have been president instead of him. Many of them had said slighting things about him. I cannot surrender a federal fort without a fight. It's the wrong message to send to Europe. But he had enough confidence and humility to know that the best thing I can do is to shore up my weaknesses. Come again, Mr. Seward? I don't know foreign policy. I've never been out of the country. I need Seward, who's traveled all over the place, who knows foreign policy. But I strongly recommend we postpone this. Until we win a battle. Just so. I don't think he worried that he'd be overshadowed. His friend said, you'll be a figurehead amidst them all. And somehow inside he's saying, no, no, don't worry about me. I'll be fine. <laughs> Lincoln had risen from the humblest of beginnings to the nation's highest office. He embodied the ideal of self-government. And he knew the Civil War could determine the fate of democracy in America and across the globe. The President of the United States! It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they here gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth.
70 years after the Gettysburg Address, the American experiment again teetered on the brink. The Great Depression cost millions their life savings. 16 million jobs gone. In their place, bread lines and starvation. When one economist asked if there was any historical precedent, he replied, yes, it lasted 400 years and was called the Dark Ages. Paralyzed, the country turned to a man who had spent years struggling to stand. You have nominated me, and I know it, and I am here to thank you for the honor. A dozen years earlier, FDR was a rising political star when he was suddenly struck down by polio. He had always had this confident, buoyant, optimistic temperament. And yet, when the polio came, it was tested severely. I mean, to imagine yourself in your late 30s, having loved athletic activity, and you find that you're paralyzed from the waist down. He would spend hours, as he said, just trying to move his one toe a little bit. And then it made him calm and patient in a way that he had not been before. And then once he got to be governor and then got to be president, I think there was a humility that hadn't been there before. And there was a sense of identifying with other people to whom fate had also dealt an unkind hand. Because he'd had this incredibly privileged life up until that point. There's no question that it deepened him. It made him a much more interesting person than he would have been before. As Inauguration Day dawned on March 4th, 1933, the New York Stock Exchange suspended trading indefinitely. Banks closed in 34 states. Millions of people couldn't buy gas, milk, or bread. For the first time since the Civil War, armed troops guarded federal buildings. America has touched bottom. 16 million out of work, the bank's tottering, business staggering. This nation is asking for action, and action now. Friends told FDR, if you succeed, you'll be the greatest president in history. If you fail, you'll be the worst one. FDR sagely replied, if I fail, I'll be the last one. This great nation will endure as it has endured. We'll revive and we'll prosper. He projected that sense that we're going to get through this and hundreds of thousands of telegrams came into the White House, you know, saying that somehow um, it's gonna be okay because you're there. And that's that mystical relationship between a leader and the followers that somehow his optimism and his belief and his confidence in himself, he projected onto the people and they felt confident in themselves that they would get out of this. It can bring to the people an attainment of their welfare. FDR trusted the people assuming all would be well if he communicated clearly with them. What FDR did on his radio chats was to really have a conversation with the American people so that when they listened in their radios, in their living rooms or their kitchens, they felt he was really there talking to them. He would say, my friends, my fellow Americans. They felt he was their friend. He could walk down the street on a hot Chicago night when one of his fireside chats was on the air and the windows would all be open, and you could hear his voice coming out of every house. You could keep walking down the street and not miss a word of what he was saying. After all, there is an element in the readjustment of our financial system more important than currency, more important than gold, and that is the confidence of the people themselves. Let us unite in banishing fear. We have provided the machinery to restore our financial system 
and it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friend, your problem no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. FDR had an eye for spotting raw political talent, including a young congressman from Texas. FDR was a mentor toward Lyndon Johnson. He looked at FDR as his daddy. He would say, he's my political daddy. And so he became, for FDR even, a symbol of that next generation. FDR once said, he's what I might have been if I hadn't gone to those privileged schools. He saw him as this really energetic, outgoing, charming young guy. That's what he was like at, at, you know, in his 20s and his early 30s. Johnson came of age in a rural Texas that time had forgot. As he later said, poverty was so common we didn't know it had a name. His parents pushed him to succeed and stung him when he failed. His mother expected so much from him. If he didn't do well in school, he would come home and she would pretend he had died. She wouldn't even talk to him. As Kennedy's vice president, Johnson was treated as an outcast, the crazy relative at the family dinner. His political career seemed all but over. I when Kennedy was killed, LBJ was seen as a usurper, a pretender to the throne. LBJ realized right away that because Texas was the place where the murder had happened, and then as it turned out, the murder of the murderer had happened, that he was not going to be seen as a legitimate president, that he hadn't won the presidency in his own right. So he knew he had to somehow establish that. Five days after taking office, LBJ addressed a joint session of Congress and a skeptical nation. This nation has experienced a profound shock. And in this critical moment, it is our duty, yours and mine, as the government of the United States to do away with uncertainty and doubt and delay and to show that we are capable of decisive action. That night, Johnson turned crisis into opportunity. In his words, history books taught me that martyrs have to die for a cause. John Kennedy had died but his cause was not clear. That was my job. Since the Civil War, Southern blacks had lived segregated lives, separate and unequal, banned from white buses, bathrooms, and hotels. LBJ was determined to change all that. No memorial oration or eulogy could more eloquently honor President Kennedy's memory than the earliest possible passage of the Civil Rights Bill for which he fought so long. And he took a real risk by going for civil rights. I mean, that's where I think he deserves the credit because had it failed, then he would have had a failed presidency, and the chances of winning the presidency on his own right would have been much diminished. But he took that shot, and, and he made it work. Now, in this summer of 1964, the Civil Rights Bill is the law of the land. In the words of the president, it restricts no one's freedom so long as he respects the rights of others. Three broken men stronger at the broken places. Freedom fighters helping millions to overcome the bondage of slavery, depression, and segregation. 
they are united by an ambition that's not simply for the office, not simply for the power, not simply for the celebrity, but rather for what they can accomplish and how they can change the world and make it a better place for their having lived in it. There's no question that when purpose gets attached to power, something magical happens.